us with a finger of love this morning. Out of our weaknesses, Lord, you come forth with your strength, and we just say thank you. We ask you to bless this service, Lord. Continue to move in our lives. Direct us. Keep us and help us to be more like thee. When it's all said and done, we'll give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. For it's in you we have our strength. It is in you we have our life. It is in you, Lord, that we have our trust. It's in you that we love, and we ask you, Lord, to forgive us of all of our sins creating us a clean heart, mold us and shape us in the image that we should be. And Father, when it's all said and done, we'll give you the glory. We'll give you the hallelujahs. We'll give you the praise. And we'll honor your name because you're above every name. We give you glory in Jesus' name. All of God's children said amen, amen, and amen. Good morning, friendship. Good morning to those of you who are here and those of you who are online. And we just be thankful this morning. It's honored that we have this Morning him, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, the author says, Jesus is mine. How many of you are glad Jesus is yours this morning? Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Oh, 
our God is great, and God is greatly to be praised. Thank God for this day we have never seen before, realizing that once this day is gone, we shall never see it again. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is not promised, and all we are assured of is right now. And so the psalmist left us good advice that this is the day that the Lord has made. And we should rejoice and be glad in it. Or as Big Mama would put it, it is just another day's journey. And we are certainly glad about it. We thank you for your presence and participation. Whether you are here or you are watching online, we say welcome to all of our visitors or first-time viewers. Uh, we consider you to be our very, very special guest. As we always say that your presence virtually or in person, is an enhancement to this worship experience. Community is important to us, and it would not be the same if you were not here. So we welcome you into the space of the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, 400 Campbell Avenue, Fayetteville, North Khaki Lackey. So let's look right here and wave at all of our online viewers and tell, let them know that they are welcome in this worship experience. Also, we want to take this time out. Uh, those who are in the sanctuary, hopefully you gave upon your entrance. If you did not have the opportunity to give when you entered the building, uh, you can give upon your exit. Amen. And if you are online, the ways to give should be on your screen uh, right now. We thank you in advance for your generous gifts and tr contributions to this ministry. Uh, we have no doubt that when you sow into this ministry that you are sowing in good ground. So thank you so much. Uh, we're not asking you for a particular amount because if you are obedient to the voice of God, we can't help to be blessed but by your obedience. Amen. So thank you so much. We had a phenomenal and wonderful time on yesterday at our uh, veteran military benefit workshop. Amen. Those of you who was here uh, know that we had a phenomenal time. This space was repurposed. Uh, and in the same place where we worship, uh, we got information for our veterans. Because if anybody deserves it, uh, you deserve it. Uh, for the sacrifices you've made uh, for our safety uh, so we can have a resemblance of a peace of mind. Uh, and James says that we ought not show partiality, but I'm a work in progress. Uh, I have a little partiality in my heart uh, for those of us who've been kissed by nature's son, that you have went away and served this country and oftentimes came back and was willing to die for a country that didn't even recognize you. And so we honor you and we thank God for you. Uh, and we say, job well done. Uh, amen. 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 I, I believe that is important and maybe it'll come out a little bit in the message. But I think that is very important to say because sometimes I think those of us who kind of hang our hat on a type of liberation theology uh, who is... Uh, unashamedly Christian uh, and unapologetically black in our presentation. Sometimes we get a bad rap as if we are anti those who served and we are not. We acknowledge you and we see you and we thank God for you. Can we give them another hand? Amen. Now this is hot off the press, all right? This is not on your church calendar, and this is the first time you're going to ever hear this, all right? On June 5th, that is the first Sunday in June, that is Pentecost Sunday, all right? June 5th, the first Sunday in June, is Pentecost Sunday, some 50 days after Easter. It concludes what we call uh, the Easter season. Now, how they know that, I promise we didn't plan that. I didn't even know they had that. All right, uh, it's Pentecost Sunday. This is what I want you to do. Uh, Pentecost Sunday, or the day of Pentecost, is known more of the glossolalia, the different languages that were spoken that everybody heard in their own language. 
And whether you know it or not, all of us in here speak different languages. If you are a physician, you got a language that we don't know about. If you're a theologian, you got a language that most of us do not know. Uh, if you do construction, you got languages that if you use a term, I wouldn't even know what you was talking about. So this is what I want us to do. I want all of us to leave this space. And on this week and the week coming, leading up to Pentecost Sunday, go to whatever job or occupation you are on, speak the language that you speak, and invite them to church on Pentecost Sunday. All right? I believe God is going to do something new and unusual uh, on that Sunday. But I want you to go and speak your language and invite them to church, Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, that is. Uh, they can view online, but if you are here this morning and you are one who opts to come to in-person worship, bring somebody with you, whether it's your school, your classmate, uh, your workmate, your mate. Uh, whoever do not regularly come to church with you, bring them on Pentecost Sunday, and I believe God will be pleased. Amen? Amen. Y'all tired of hearing me ramble? Let's go and have a little bit more church and give a God a hand praise for our praise team as they come uh, to bless us. Oh, 
It's going to turn it around. It's, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work in your favor. Let's do this. Before we move uh, to the word, I want you free, not only in your worship, um, but I want your mind to be free to listen what it, to what it is God has given us. Uh, and I want to give you the opportunity to bring your problems and your burdens to the altar. Uh, so before we move, uh, to the word of God as our ministers come forth um, we're going to ask those who want something specific in your life to be addressed and taken for the throne of God to feel free come up and one of our ministers will say a brief word of prayer with you with fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Amen.
Glory to God. 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 Psalm 137, Psalm 137. Ah. Psalm 137. Every time I sense or feel that the Lord has given what I call a prophetic assignment, I feel the stress of the prophetic all in my person so y'all pray for me uh, that I shake off some of these nerves yeah Psalm 137 and 3 Psalm 137 and 3 for there those who carried us away captive and asked of us a song and those who plundered us requested mirth saying sing us one of the songs of Zion you may be seated in the presence of the Lord for there are those who carried us away captive asked us for a song and those who plundered us requested mirth or joy Saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. I want to tag this text with the title, I Don't Feel Like It. I don't, I don't feel like it. To some controversial to others unsettling to most of us it is uncomfortable the word is imprecatory I-M P-R E-C-A T-O-R-Y M Precatory. It means to invoke or to call down evil or curses upon a person or to denunciate. The word for today is imprecatory. And today, what I just read in your hearing was a small portion of what would be considered an imprecatory psalm. That is to say that this psalm or song is a prayer to God that invoked judgment, calamity, and curses upon one's enemy. An imprecatory psalm is a psalm that wishes and hopes that God would deal harshly with one's enemy for the evil that the enemy has inflicted upon them. In other words, an imprecatory psalm or prayer is a 
get them, God, pray. It directly addresses the anger of the prayer toward an injustice that is perpetually and consistently being inflicted upon a person or a people. In real sense, it is an individual or a people who are fed up with being mistreated and has concluded that if God doesn't take care of them, then they will kill me. And as a result, a prayer, a petition is directed toward the divine that ultimately prays that evil is returned for evil. Because evil is not only stressing them, but the evil is literally killing them. So God is either them or me. It is, in essence, a prayer or a psalm of self-defense. Maybe that is more palatable than imprecatory. It is a psalm of self-defense, an imprecatory psalm that literally prays evil on one's enemy can be considered a psalm of self-defense. You've heard that word, correct? Defending yourself from harm. Self-defense, the legal justification for the use of force, even lethal force in times of danger. Self-defense, you've heard of it. We have self-defense techniques and types like jiu-jitsu or karate or taekwondo. We have self-defense weapons, tasers and guns and knives. We even have self-defense laws that you can match the level of threat in question. We even have self-defense laws that leave loopholes for the aggressor, kind of like the George Zimmerman Trayvon Martin episode. We discovered a stand your ground law that leaves loopholes for the aggressor, which is to say that if the aggressor starts to lose, even if they pick the fight when they feel threatened, they can take somebody's life. So you can be told not to follow a young man with tea and Skittles. And when you follow him and get in combat with him and he starts getting the best of you, you can claim your life was threatened even though you were the aggressor. So self-defense is baked into our practices and self-defense is baked into our laws and we accept them as necessary even if we are Christian. But for some reason, we have no problem with self-defense practices. But we are uncomfortable, many of us, with self-defense prayers. We can be scared enough and emotional enough and even fearful enough to use lethal force on someone that is attempting to harm us because it is the law. But it makes us uncomfortable and it becomes controversial when we hear self-defense language. But I want to suggest to us today that if self-defense language or language of revenge or if language of vitriol and bitterness if that type of language is repulsive or offensive to you, then at least over 100 verses in Psalms will be unreadable to you. You do know the Psalms are not only songs of happiness and praise, 
but there are over 100 verses of songs in the Psalms that literally call for vengeance and destruction. Maybe that causes us to clutch our proverbial pearls and stick up our noses at such notions because as PNs would suggest, we are so busy trying to defend the Bible that we are missing what is actually in the Bible. One such psalm is found in Psalm 109. And that psalm is credited to David, the musician, the faithful shepherd, David, the man that scripture declares is a man after God's own heart. It is Psalm 109 that that David laments to God in anger about the destruction, chaos, and evil, and even the death that he is wishing on his enemy. Let me give you a verse or two of this man of God's prayer. Let his days be few, David asked. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. That's in your Bible. And these are unsettling words from a man of God. And I know since you've been saved, you have never been angry. And you've never been so violated. And you've never been so hurt by someone that you wish evil upon them. I know you've never done that. I know you have a forgiving heart. And every time you see blatant injustice, you go to prayer meeting and start speaking in tongues. I know you have mastered all of the church's sound bites. Sort of like unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping your enemy dies, end quote. But maybe or perhaps there is somebody listening to this little sermon that is kind of like me and you have gotten angry sometime and hurt sometime and you have prayed like David, Lord, get up. Even in the psalm that we read today, this particular psalm, its nine verses, paints a scene of captives who are mourning by the rivers of Babylon. They are being mocked by their captors. This psalm, Psalm 137, expresses a vow to remember Jerusalem when they are in exile. But even though it opens with a vow to remember Jerusalem, it closes with fantasies of vengeance against the oppressor in the most vile and vicious way one can think of. I don't even want to read it, but you read it yourself. Read what the psalmist says he hopes happens to his enemy's babies. The point here that these psalms emphasizes and it confirms that even good-hearted people get angry. That even loving people get mad. This reality lived to me, people of God. When I was in the gym about a week ago, and I could not relax my mind because I was on the treadmill and my back was to the door. I was paranoid as my mind was subconsciously mapping out an exit strategy for how to get out of there in case something went down. And it hit me in that moment that I was traumatized by recent events. A true story. I left the gym, sat in my car, and cried. 
I had no idea that the perpetual threat of violence from domestic terrorism on black bodies so resided in my psyche and person. So at that moment, all I could do is cry in anger because of the exhaustion of being black in America. In that moment, I remembered two post-traumatic stress responses that I believe I've shared with you before. One was when my nephew told me that he went so long without a driver's license and a car because he was scared to be pulled over by police. So he decided it would be better for him to catch the bus and not drive. And the other one was of my father who needs assistance from a device to speak, who now resides in Nashville, Tennessee, who told me he goes nowhere unless absolutely necessary because he feared being pulled over, reaching for his speaking device, and that will be used as an excuse to assassinate him. And with all that on my mind, there I was trying to watch the door and engage in self-care at the same time. Of course, all of these emotions was triggered by an 18-year-old white supremacist hate-fueled massacre at the Topps Friendly Market in Buffalo, New York that targeted black people. 13 people shot, 10 precious bodies murdered in cold blood for one reason only, they were black. He drove 200 miles, over 200 miles, with hate consuming him to kill and to alter the lives of families forever. Cold calculated, calm, and cool, with precision, not shooting randomly, as he apologizes to a white customer who was in the store because that was not his target, while he continues to murder black humans and a shot by a black security guard hits him but does not injure him because he came prepared with body armor. No doubt systematized by far right leaning talking points from people like Fox News' Tucker Carson talking about replacement theory. It was captured in his 180 page manifesto that was filled with hateful rants about race and ties to what he called the great replacement. This is a conspiracy theory that states that non-white individuals are being brought into the United States and other Western countries to replace white voters for the point of achieving a political agenda. It is an often parroted talking point by anti-immigration groups, white supremacists, and others. It is, in essence, arguing that the influx of people of color will lead to the extinction of the white race. The 18-year-old home grown domestic terrorist allegedly said in his creed that the decrease in white birth rates equates to white genocide. It is a real fear of extremists that their privilege is in jeopardy and other voices will dominate the narratives. Al Duffo's Belt Jr., professor of political science of African studies in Winthrop University said that white, national, white nationalist movements 
arise when people of color are seen as a threat in the political and economic realm. Be patient with me, it gets worse. It is that type of ideology and it is that type of rhetoric that greatly contributed to a mass shooting that overlooked the humanity of black people in lieu of a theory that is no doubt rooted in white supremacy and white American exceptionalism. Not to mention the unusual restraint that was shown by authorities that civilly arrested a heavily armed white domestic terrorist. And I can't even front. I am not well. And I am not well and with me not being well, I cannot be influenced nor can I be shamed into not talking about matters of race and social justice and the value gaps that exist in these yet to be United States of America. I cannot be convinced that preaching and pulpits should not be used for abolitionist work. And you cannot say things like, but what about black on black crime in an attempt to try to shut prophetic mouths? I've been to crack houses in the hood personally retrieving somebody's infant grandbaby. I, along with the local nation of Islam in Tennessee, sat in spaces with rival gangs trying to get them to call a truce while my legs are shaking beneath the table hoping nothing don't go down. I'm the wrong one to talk to about black on black crime. I ain't new to this. I'm true to this. That's why I do this. I fight on both sides of the aisle. So shaming and spewing rhetoric as if this do not belong in pulpits that is prophetic malfunction and biblical malpractice not to talk about injustice in the world. It will be disingenuous of us to celebrate the great prophetic voices like Martin Luther King Jr. and Frederick Douglass or Fannie Lou Hamer and Harriet Tubman and be scared or refuse to use our voices to follow their examples. For it was that drum major of justice, Dr. Martin Luther King himself, who quoted Victor Hugo when he said, and I quote, if the soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. The guilty one is not he who commits the sin, but the one who causes the darkness. End quote. That it'll be disingenuous of me to wear my black fists on my shirt doing Juneteenth but be scared to talk about black stuff. So the question is how should we feel about this? What should our response be? What should the mood be around this issue? And what should our dispositions be? Got it. Here is the solution. Shout about it. I got it. Here is the solution. Praise our way through it. That'll fix it, right? I got it. I know how to satisfy our discomfort. Let us have a praise break and everything will be perfect. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor is over. <laughs> Injustice, poof, voila, it's gone. Veronica White whose nephew, Andre McKenna, was at the market to buy his baby a surprise birthday cake for his three-year-old son's birthday. When he was shot 
in the back of the head. So when Miss White go to church, I'm going to tell her to dance. Because when praises go up, blessings come down. Everything gets better. Or Terza Patterson, who was married to Deacon Haywood Patterson for 15 years questioned how she was going to raise the 12 year old son without his father by his side Miss Patterson don't worry about it just lift up your hands and give him glory Robin Whitfield the eldest daughter of Ruth Whitfield who was slain on this fateful day said her mother was her best friend and the two had plans to see the temptations that night in concert. And even now, those two tickets to the temptations concert is left on her table as a reminder of what was supposed to be a night of fun, a night of dancing, a night of laughter, became a day of mourning and sadness and unspeakable grief. But if she just think positive, and if she just can sing happy songs, then she will wake up in the morning and things will be fixed, right? How should the mother or the parents or the loved ones of Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Atiana Jefferson, Botham John, Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, Renisha McBride, Ahmaud Arbery, Sean Reed, and countless other black bodies that was hung on southern trees as strange fruit. How should they feel about the death of their unarmed babies? when the likes of heavily armed domestic white terrorists be taken into custody without incident and taken to Burger King to get breakfast? What should their mood and disposition be? Well, the text captures the realness of a people with broken hearts trying to make sense of what they are experiencing and witnessing. The people of God, Israel, in our text, were in exile in Babylon. They are being indoctrinated and being made to assimilate to a culture that is foreign to them. And they are left with their memories of what it used to be. This psalm is a lyrical masterpiece that takes place between years 587 and 586 BC. It was after the Babylonians had conquered Judea. They destroyed their place of worship and burned it to the ground. And here they are in a foreign place in a foreign place where their gifts and talents and styles were appropriated and used for the oppressor's amusement. The author of this psalm is a captive in exile, sitting by the streams of Babylon, hung his harp on the willow tree, pouring out the people's deep pain and loss. And in this psalm, the author accounts the pain of being forced to sing for the entertainment of the captors. That's what we just read. We read an author recounting the pain of being forced to sing and to praise for the entertainment of their oppressors. While in this land, here is what the text says in verses 1 and 2. They wept and they hung up their hearts. 
while there in obvious dismay, their oppressors ask them to sing one of them good praise and worship numbers. They were weeping. Their instruments are not in their hands, but hung up. That is a clear sign that singing and performing is the last thing that is on their minds. They are lamenting the state of their people and all of the loss they have experienced. And those who carried them away captive had the antagonistic audacity to ask them to sing. Listen to the text. Verse 3. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. I see your harp hung up. I see your depressed and sad disposition. You ain't in the mood to play and sing. But do us a favor. Sing us one of those happy songs y'all used to sing in Jerusalem. Sing for our amusement and entertainment. Show us how y'all do it. We like how y'all sound. We like the style. We like the swag that comes with the presentation. We know you are hurting, but sing for us. We know you keep watching state-sponsored lynchings on network news and on the internet, but praise your way through it. We know of voter suppression, gentrification, prison industrial complex, lead in your waters, school to prison pipelines, redlining, redistricting, stand your ground laws, infant mortality rates, pollution in your communities, lack of investment in education for your people, but sing anyway. And hear me, I know the songs of lament and praise has been a part of our people's stories for centuries and continues to be. But sometimes I do not feel like putting on a happy face. Sometimes I don't feel like tap dancing at the request of empire because of their expectations of black faith communities to be docile and decent and passive, and skin and grin, acting like that our only option is to comply. Because sometimes my praise to God is my soul lamenting to God while resisting and refusing to participate in respectability Christianity. You know, respectability politics. It is also respectability Christianity. But I refuse and we ought to refuse to engage in respectability Christianity. It is a refusal to demonstrate empty symbolism in the name of unity when there is an obvious injustice. But after the prayer vigil is over, And after the kumbaya moment is over, there is no fight for real change in policy that affects my people. It is denying the invitation to accept the non-liberating tenets of a hand-me-down theology and gospel that was given to me by my enslavers that emphasized texts like slaves obey your masters while neglecting to teach me that even the birth, the life, and the death of Jesus had political overtones and ramifications. It is a refusal, and that it it refused to teach me that justice does not intersect with Jesus, but justice is the walking embodiment of Jesus. And if Jesus is the walking embodiment of justice, we should be the walking embodiment of justice in the earth if we claim to be the body of Christ. It is really thinking God is American. 
It is really thinking God's favorite hymn is God bless America. It is a refusal to see Jesus as a brown skinned Palestinian that hung out in North Africa. I don't care how much we try to de-Africanize Egypt, but it's hard to hide and you got white skin in Africa. But it's like we have made Christianity exclusive to Western and American theology. It is making my faith a social club of elitists. Why am I preaching this? I got an anniversary next month. I better calm down. It is, it, it is making my faith a social club of elitists that majors on who we can let out and who we can keep in. It is a theology that majors in who I'm going to sit down and who I'm going to receive. It is a theology of exclusion when Jesus preached a gospel of inclusion. Whosoever will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. But the church has become less whosoever and who can I pick? It is a social club of elitists that majors on who we let in and who we keep out. But it is fighting on the behalf of of all marginalized life because we know and believe that all life bear the image of God. All. You hear what I'm saying? All life bears the image of God. I didn't mean to go here, but I know I brought one amen, so um, I, uh, I remember, I remember Beverly doing justice work and black preachers were scared they stood behind me one time but once I got too radical and too crazy they left you can google it there's a press conference it's about 50 black preachers standing behind me then if you google the next press conference it's about 12 then you google the next it's about 2 then you google the next ain't nobody but the members of our church but then it hit me that God loves us all I'm about to mess up. And everybody deserves a safe place to live. Everybody who occupies space on earth deserves the grace of God to make a decent wage. God don't want nobody to be marginalized and left out. So guess what my crazy behind did? I called up Kevin Muhammad the local leader of the nation of Islam. I knew he wasn't scared. And we tried our best to turn the city upside down. But guess what? The scared preachers who wanted to exclude my brother from the nation but were scared to fight on behalf of their own people. So give me somebody who ain't scared. I don't care what your faith tradition is, that if you bear the image of God and I can look in your face and see the image of God, no matter if you call yourself Christian or not, I will fight on your behalf. But that's a gospel of exclusion. But you can only work with people that think like you and believe like you and go to church with you and know the same hymns as you. The devil is a lie. That if you look at the picking and the choosing of the 12 disciples, none of them come out of the religious establishment. Thank you. I've been preaching all these years and still forget a handkerchief. I said I was going to get out this paper. Ah. It's, it's a request to sing while you're sad because of the lack of style and sound. But I want to know, not do you like my style and my sound, but will you join me in the struggle for the liberation of my people because your request is denied. 
I don't feel like it. I, I, don't, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like singing you one of them songs. Have life ever left you like that? Where you come to church and everybody running and the preacher talking about slap your neighbor and look at your neighbor and shout and you don't feel like it? God's word for you today is that you don't got to feel like it. And when you don't feel like it, even if your church neighbor is mad, God ain't mad because God understands. And somebody came to church this morning not feeling like it. And I don't feel like it because my praise to God is in my refusal to do what you think I should do. My praise to God is refusing to do what you think I should do while you try to make me believe it's God's will for me to do it. I know God for myself and I don't need nobody who practices colonized Christianity, even if you black, to tell me how to respond in my pain. I don't feel like it. Sing one of them songs. Sing one of them Zion songs. Well, request denied. I, I don't feel like it. I don't, I don't feel like it because rage is a result of pain that has been ignored. That you've been ignoring my pain because I've been praising through it. But today you're going to see my pain. Because I ain't tap dancing for you no more. I don't feel like it. I'm tired of being the white church in black face. Tired of adapting to a hand-me-down theology that was given to me and told me, don't critique it, just do it. That if I can't critique it, it ain't a faith worth me having. You ain't going to look past my pain because of my praise no more because it only became pain or it only became rage when my pain was ignored. So you overlooking my pain, trying to tell me to be a good Christian and telling me how good Christians are supposed to act by cherry picking scripture and being a selective biblical literalist trying to act like you all smart. You cannot dictate the form of my praise, uh -oh, nor can you dictate my willingness to forgive while not acknowledging my deep hurt. Because I'm arguing today that uh, demanding my forgiveness while I'm still processing my trauma is violence to my soul. Y'all should have shouted on God's going to turn it around. That was your shout time. <laughs> Demanding my forgiveness while I'm still processing my trauma is violence to my soul. I know. I know. I know what you're thinking. God forgave you. So why don't you forgive everybody? Who are you not to forgive? You know, those colonized talking points. Who are you not to forgive? God has given you. You are more like God when you are being forgiven. Jesus on the cross, Reverend, said, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. Y'all hear that? I said, don't demand my forgiveness while I'm processing my trauma. And the argument would be that Jesus forgave even while on the cross because Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And if you read the text carefully, you will see that in that moment, even Jesus is teaching that forgiveness is a process. I hate to bring down your Christology, but the text didn't say Jesus said, I forgive you. Y'all ain't feeling me here. Jesus says, Father, you forgive them. 
Because sometimes I got to let God do the forgiving while I'm in the pain because I don't feel like it. God, I don't want to say forgive them. I want to say get them. I don't want to say God bless you. I want to say. So while I'm in my feelings and while I'm angry and while I'm mad and while tears are falling down my eyes, while I'm trying to remember my grandmother crying with joy when Obama became the first black president and then two days later crying with grief when Jordan Davis got executed and was an innocent man. I don't know how to process all that. So don't ask me to forgive and shout. Just sit with me in my pain because I don't feel like it. Father, you forgive them. God, I got to catch up with you because I ain't there yet. Forgive them. I tried. I tried to hold hands and pray in circles at prayer visuals because it's good optics. But after I left the prayer room, they still gentrified my neighborhood. I tried to join their reformation and be impressed because they got a black church division now in their denominations. And I believed them when they said they love me. But then they decided on the side of white comfort over my black body and 85% of white evangelicals voted for my oppressor. I don't feel like it. Because you do know there are different brands of Christianity. There are Christianities. You can't tell me the God of Martin King is the God of Donald Trump. You can't tell me the God of Andrew de Klerk was the God of Nelson Mandela. The God of Pharaoh was not the God of Moses. The God of Trump is not the God of Jeremiah Wright. That while Pharaoh was saying, God, thank you for my slaves. The slaves was praying to God saying, God, deliver me from slavery. They are not the same God. While slave and slavers were on the top of the ship writing hymns, my people was packed like sardines and literally drowning in their own manure, praying for God's deliverance. And some decided that I'd rather die and rest in a liquid grave. Because before I be a slave, I be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. Tim, 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 you done jumped out here. I tried. I pride. Because... You, you, can't, you can't be pro-death penalty, pro-unrestricted gun rights, pro-war, pro-torture, pro-health care repeal, pro-defending every extrajudicial murder of unarmed black persons, and then turn around talking about I'm pro-life. You pro-life, even though you were part of the over 50 House Republicans that voted against the $28 million emergency fund to address the lack of baby formula. But you love those babies, though. Don't be fooled by the rhetoric because Christianity and trust in Christ is more than a profession. It is a practice. It's more than what you confess with your mouth. It's the character you display from your heart. That we don't hear that terminology enough in our faith tradition. We hear a practice in Hindus and practice in Muslims and practice in this or that. But we don't hear about practice in Christians. Because we have made our faith so convenient. 
and what Diedrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. Means I just say it and I believe it, but I don't got to behave like it. Oh, yeah, you behave like it, don't you? Because you don't go to clubs. You behave like it because you ain't drunk since last weekend. You behave like it because you don't like those funny cigarettes. Oh, you behave like it because all you listen to is gospel music. You, you, you behave like it because every dress you got come to your ankle. You behave like it because all you wear is three-piece suits. But it's about how we treat other people. You know what God revealed to me the other day? That we have an influx of hurting people that are hurting. I'm on a tangent now, but I get back that are hurting because of religious trauma. That we think God called us to be people's moral judges. That to police what they do in their personal time. And we spend our time concerned about what is going on in people's bedrooms instead of focusing on what's going on in boardrooms that affect your life. Because what people do in their bedroom, guess what? It taint none of your business. No, it ain't. You ain't more holy because you got rid of the evidence. My rage is a result. My pain that is ignored. And I can, now I will talk about black on black crime. Black on black religious crime. We've killed more people with the Bible than some have done with bullets. That we use our Bibles as bricks and our word as the weapon not to fight the devil, but to fight each other. You, you, you know what? The more I learn about God and the Bible, the less judgmental I come and the more humble I become. Because I realize the more I learn about God, the more I don't know nothing. That every morning I wake up, God keeps showing me new sides of God's self. And so I'm humble when I grab this book. I grab it with fear and trembling. And I read it in the context of oppression. Can we go to Bible class? Because from Genesis to Revelation, that's why I don't understand when people say, don't preach justice, just preach Jesus. If you ain't preaching justice, you ain't preaching Jesus. It was Jesus who said in Jesus' initial sermon that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah, for I have been anointed to preach the good news to the poor, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's justice. It was the authorities that was trying to find justice when they was caught up in a system of oppression. That's why Pilate wanted to let him go. But he couldn't because he was caught up in a system. When we say judgment hall to judgment hall, that's political. His cousin was beheaded by Herod, political. Herod wanted to kill him when he was two years, political. This book is full of political propaganda and agendas. From Genesis to Revelation, it's written in the context of oppression. 
Don't believe that God wants your soul saved but don't care nothing about your body. Don't believe that. That is the biggest trick of the enemy. To think that God cares nothing about your body, just wanted to save your soul. Read James Cone's book, The Cross and the Lichen Tree. He got articles of right after church, they will have public lynching with invocation and prayer and hymn singing. How can you kill a body while praying to God? It's because you believe that God separates us, that God cares about our soul but don't care nothing about our body. But it was that African articulate apostle from Tarsus that said that we ought to present our. From Genesis to Revelation, it's Egyptian oppression, Assyrian oppression, Babylonian oppression, Assyrian oppression, Roman oppression. You can't read the Bible without reading oppression. I'm in Bible country. All right. I hope they ain't doing a case study on us today. You know, remember I told you about that church doing a case study? They said, your church is perfect. You just preach too long. Let me wrap it up. Rage is a result of pain. Ignore. Y'all still love me? All right. We'll shout next week. Rage is a result of pain. Ignore. But let me end with this point, and I want you to hear me, that real prayers ushers us into divine intimacy. It is Christian to pray for your enemy and for those who despitefully use you. But in Matthew 6, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, but before he teaches them how to pray, he teaches them how not to pray. He says, don't pray like the hypocrites and heathens. I'm not calling you a hypocrite or a heathen, but Jesus is telling his disciples that hypocrites and heathens taught you how to pray. It is like hand me down hypocrisy. And hypocrite is another word for an actor or actress who plays a role on stage and wear a mask. Jesus is saying that when you pray, pray with your mask off. When you pray, take off your mask. Don't pray like hypocrites and heathens. So it is embedded in us to deny our feelings. Get past your feelings. Get you, girl, you and your feelings. And we use denial as if denial is a spiritual response. It is embedded in us to deny our feelings and be complicit in our own oppression because we've been taught that uh, our oppression is the will of God. Because if it wasn't God's will, he wouldn't have went in that supermarket and shot him. It must be God's will. And if I'm honest, I've thought like that. That dismay and, and destruction and such heinous activities must be the will of God. But it was not the will of God, hear me, for those young budding theologians that's trying to make sense of faith and Christianity. Let me try to make sense of it the best I can. I don't know at all. Lord knows I don't know much at all. But let me give you what I believe. It was not God's will for them people to die like they died. It was somebody using their own free will that had been systematized, not radicalized, but systematized to hate and to believe the hype of his own privilege and decided to kill people. God did not sanction that. And God did not ordain that. 
because God is a God of justice and liberation. We have been literally taught to pray with our mask on. Here is the theology. Fake it till you make it. I ain't faking no more. When I don't feel like it, I just don't feel like it. Now, I ain't going to be mean. Try not to be. But sometimes you got to process your feelings and don't make people rush you to get past them. Here is my point. I believe that God would rather us have authentic anger than fake praise. God's word for you today is that God can handle your pain. And God can handle your pain that has morphed into rage. And God will not only guide us through it, but God will love us while we are in it. All I've been struggling to tell you for the past 10 minutes I've been preaching is that we know Psalms is about worship and praise. And worship and praise at its purest is when one is not in denial about their truth. If we are to be genuine worshipers, we first have to be honest worshipers. Jesus told the woman at the well that if you're going to worship God, you got to worship God in spirit and in truth. If you do not think God can handle your truth, your worship is false. God can handle where you are. And some of us are so judgmental that we miss the grace in imprecatory. Because the psalm is appealing to the vengeance of God, which is really an act of nonviolence. Because the psalmist is refusing to take matters into his own hands. He is ultimately declaring, Lord, I will put it in your hand. It is really a prayer of nonviolence. It is saying, God, Before I go do something crazy, I'm going to pray to you, and I'm going to get it off my chest. And God can handle it when you get it off your chest, not when you deny. Have the talk with Jesus. Refuse to be complicit in your own oppression By thinking you got to dance through your destruction. No, you can cry through it. You can lament through it. You can be honest with God about it. And I'm speaking on the scale of injustice from a civil level. Some of us have experience of personal injustice. And you feel oppressed by your own community. And I believe, I believe from the bottom of my heart, that the church, plural, the black church specifically, will see our finest hour if we stop cutting and pasting how they do stuff in our context. That we have learned oppression very well. We have learned how to oppress each other real good. We will find any reason to other people That's learned behavior. We find any reason to include people and exclude others. Oh, and we got cherry pick the scripture to show you that we're right. I can make the, listen, this is a dangerous book in the wrong hands. It's dangerous, Lily. Jump up, jump, Jesus. The Bible say the devil said. The Bible say the devil said. The Bible say the devil said to Jesus that angels will take charge over you. So don't you be impressed with somebody that can quote Genesis to Revelation. The devil can too. Good job. Good for you.
I'm done. Can y'all tell like, in my mind, I'll try to think of a cute way to close it. I ain't got nothing cute today. I was going to make a beeline to the cross one Friday. I, I was trying to figure that thing out. Then my notes got messed up. I said, I, it must be done. In the, in the language of my Guller Geechee brothers and sisters, it's a done done. Put your hands together and give the Lord. Ah, those, wow. those, those are the hardest ones to preach out. Mm. I couldn't sleep all night in fear and trembling. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, yeah, I, I'd rather not. My father told me, who was a Vietnam veteran, I, I like when you preach the other way better. That's what he told me. I like when you preach those other kind of sermons. Uh, I'm sorry, Dad, if you're watching. Pray that God is pleased. God be pleased. I pray that I handle that text responsibly. God, I pray that our application was as on spot as I humanly possibly can be. Um, God, I pray that I know what is good news to others are offensive to some. But our aim is to comfort those who are distressed and make uncomfortable those who are too comfortable because our work is tedious and our aim for justice is hard work but we're going to march it together as the body of Christ and continue to speak truth to power but even more importantly we want to be able to speak truth to the powerless and empower them for the work of love and justice in the world. If somebody is here and the only presentation of the gospel they've ever heard was a presentation of the gospel that was docile and non-confrontational. That when they hear the gospel of that brown Redeemer, that karma colored Christ, that save a skin Savior, that come to liberate their black souls. We pray that that gospel resonates, that that gospel is liberating. that God cares about their context and not just taking them to heaven. That God cares about how they live and not just how they die. For the gospel is about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. That we can't get to the death without talking about how he lived. And he lived to liberate the souls and bodies of those who are oppressed. It is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come on, stand all over the building. If you're here, you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Wow. <laughs> or you're online and you want to um, you want to join our church, you can go to our website, fmbc, f-a-y-n-c dot org, fmbc, F-A-Y-N-C dot org. Go to the e-membership tab and you can join our church. Give your life to Christ. Watch, care, whatever uh, God is leading you to do. We are open arms in our reception of you. Or if you're in this space today and you feel like God is pulling you to unite with this faith community, I'll meet you at the altar. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Amen. Remain standing. Remain standing. Remember to invite a friend uh, to church. Still invite them, please. All right? Invite them, please. Invite them. Invite them to church on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, I can't make no promises, but uh, it is our aim to preach about the relevance of Pentecost. 
and what it really means. And I think uh, that people will be blessed by that. So if they don't have a church home or they do have a church home but willing to come with you, please invite them on Pentecost Sunday uh, for what I believe is going to be a great uh, worship experience. Man, all right. All right, we love you, and we thank God for you, and we pray that you have a lovely and a wonderful week. Before we get out of here, I need y'all to do me one favor, and I need it. I need it. I need you, even with your mask on, to smile at me. All right, I needed that. All right. Now may the love of God and the sweet communion of God's spirit the justice of God, the liberating power of the Holy Ghost, that spirit that makes us better for the other and not make us better than the other. In the name of that God who brought us here in community to worship and to lament together, we give him all praise. Because all praise belong to him anyway. May that spirit rest. May that spirit rule. May that spirit abide with us now and forevermore. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. will be seated. The ushers will dismiss you in their family.